My name is uh, Jacob and Christian. Hi guys, my name is Christian. And as you can hear, we are both from uh, from Denmark actually. Uh, so we in the valley in Topo last year uh, with our startup called Purity and we're part of the Boots VC, the accelerated one in, yeah, in San Mateo. Um, but now we moved up to the city and we yeah, are kicking it doing a lot of the security stuff in, in the Bitcoin space. Um, so Kind of the agenda today is just a quick introduction around uh, security, what we actually do. Um, and then we'll talk a bit around uh, web application security within the Bitcoin space. And uh, we'll give you an example of what we call capture the coin. We have hidden some private keys in our website and ask some security researchers basically go and you know, take those. Uh, <clears throat> but first, the uh, crowd security. So crowd security is, is actually a crowdsourced uh, web security. So web application security. So we have built this platform where we connect at the moment around 1,000 uh, security researchers uh, from all around the world. And, and we connect them with businesses that want to improve their, their web security. Um, and a lot of these businesses are Bitcoin businesses, of course. We also have a couple of non-Bitcoin, but most of them are actually Bitcoin businesses. And this is a lot of Bitcoin wallets, it's a lot of Bitcoin exchanges, and just Bitcoin businesses in general. Because, of course, all of these businesses are very interested around you know, testing their security and doing it in a smart manner. And basically leveraging your crowd to test your security, that's a lot cheaper, it's a lot smarter, and you get a completely different kind of um, test of your web app compared to if you just had like a security consultant. Um, so some of these businesses are, for example, Volo Satoshi, which is a Canadian uh, Bitcoin exchange. Here in, in the valley, it's uh, Bitme or Forum, uh, some we've been testing with for some time. It's um, it's Bitgo, uh, it's Blockchain Info, it's Hive. Um, so a lot of just Bitcoin businesses from, from all around the world, uh, and both in the US and in Europe. Uh, so in Europe, it's just JustCoin in Norway, uh, Poloniex, uh, and so forth. Um, so, um, how many of you are familiar with the concept of a bug bounty program? Okay, cool. Great, nice. Uh, so that's basically what Crowdcurity is, is bug bounty program as a service. A uh, bug bounty program is basically that a business commits to paying out a reward or a bounty to a security tester if they can identify uh, and report, uh, make a proof of concept of how to um, Basically, identify a security issue and a proof of concept for how that could be exploited in a, in a, in a web application. Um, and then they commit to paying out a bounty to, to that security tester. So, that is basically uh, what we do. So, what's interesting there is that this way of approaching security mirrors kind of the way that attackers work. Uh, so, if you're a malicious guy, you want to steal something from a website, you don't get rewarded per hour or you know, I don't know, how many reports you deliver or whatever but you get rewarded basically when you're able to compromise the site. So if you want to kind of defend yourself against kind of that attack, you need to have the similar incentives on the defense side. And that is basically what we're simulating with doing kind of a boundary approach because there are also the security researchers are on earning their bounty once they to identify that specific issue. Um, so the other thing is, of course, that you, that you crowdsource it, meaning that uh, you'll be you're exposing your business to people from all around the world. So there are uh, like security testers in Australia that might be very you know, uh, specialized in one specific area and, and in a guy in, in Britain or somewhere else that you knows some others, right? So you're really leveraging the, the knowledge of the crowd to test the, the web application, which again mirrors the threat, right? Because attackers are also all around the world. So you, you need to kind of have that uh, leveling playing field. Okay. So how does all that tie into uh, Bitcoin security? Um, so the way that, so Crowdcurity basically do security testing at the web application layer. And so this, therefore we do it for a lot of Bitcoin businesses, but also for some non-Bitcoin businesses. And uh, if you think around kind of the, the supply chain of end users having Bitcoins, so they both hold Bitcoins, they need to store them, they need to manage them, and they also need to access them. And just the fact of the matter is that in the foreseeable future, uh, most end users are still going to access their Bitcoin basically through a web app or through the browser. Um, so therefore, it kind of 
it means that security in the browser and, in, and the application layer is suddenly exposed a lot more than it was previously. And it kind of, uh, Bitcoin have kind of forced us to realize that how bad our security is online. Uh, and we now need to also improve really the security of the web application layer. And so this goes hand in hand with a lot of other developments in the security space within Bitcoin. Like you'll have a lot of startups doing cold storage uh, around how to store your, your keys in a smart manner. You have startups doing multi-sig uh, around how to manage and, and separate ownership and, and control of when to release your Bitcoin transactions. And then on top of that, you would have web application security. So you can see that's kind of like a traditional uh, security stack, you can say, when dealing with Bitcoins. And we are one element in that stack kind of on the, uh, kind of facing the, the end users once they access the Bitcoin. Okay, so cool. So that was kind of just a, a big introduction to uh, what we're doing, the state of the art of security, and how we kind of fit into, into that level. Uh, so I will hand over the word to uh, Christian, who's going to walk through uh, a couple of examples of uh, some security issues that we see at websites and basically show how they can be exploit exploited in our own app. So we make kind of a vulnerable app for our own website that is not live, but it's just locally. <laughs> um, and trying to, to show some of these uh, examples how they can be exploited and hopefully uh, you can learn more. Uh, how to prevent those when building wallets and exchanges and, and so forth. And, yeah, but we're like seeing smart, uh, seeing more trends of, uh, I guess, better built web apps for Bitcoin, or is so it still the same? Or? Very good question. In general, the Bitcoin businesses have a lot better security than any you know other apps online. I mean, just the fact that I think almost no wallet will launch today without offering two-factor authentication. And I don't think, I mean, I mean, I use Wells Fargo, I got no two-factor authentication there. So, so you definitely see just a completely different kind of security uh, measures already in place in, in the wallets and exchanges. And that is definitely needed, but uh, yeah, we still got kind of further to go. So um, yeah, I think that what we see also is that in general for security, the, the, the Bitcoin businesses, they just know that they need to act, act upon this. and, I did, and I, I would say a couple of years ahead now for the rest of the industry and, or any other web apps um, in terms of their security. I think it's hard to say that like, I think at, like during like the last half year or year, has it changed? I don't know, I mean you have three times as many as half a year ago or a year ago. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't know, it, I, don't know I, I can't really see that it's has gotten better, um, but the uh, problem analysis would probably answer that. Yeah. Um, I think stuff like the multi-sig and just, you have a lot of different uh, security measures coming through, and, and crowd purity, right? I think uh, um, that it will become standard uh, that all kind of business actually run a cloud boundary program and uh, basically to improve their, their security and end users will demand that uh, a wallet or an exchange or any kind of web app is doing this and communicating that they really take their uh, security seriously and leveraging kind of the crowd to improve their security. Okay, uh, so let's jump to some of the uh, examples uh, we see um, kind of how to um, yes. exploit websites. And after that, we will talk a bit around how we do uh, security at crowd purity. So what are some of the things, because we are targeting ourselves, so what do we do to prevent all of these things? Um, not getting hacked, and then we'll go to uh, capture the coin. Oh, by the way, uh, when we're going to show uh, capture the coin, uh, if someone, if we're going to basically give your private key on the screen, and uh, if someone is able to kind of steal that in, and you know, an, no, no, a QR code, QR code, you, want, QR, you, want take a um, you there will be some Bitcoin uh, that you can basically get for free today, um, and <laughs> kind of we will just do a live example and see what, what happens. So I think what, uh, as uh, Jacob said. Um, so a lot of it comes down to it's, it can be, I mean, the, it's relatively easy to trick the user. So like the end user has no idea what they're doing. So, um, and the hacker will essentially try to, you know, hack the, the, the weakest link. Um, so um, I'm going to show this uh, title called the text. I'm going to show a few examples of like some simple things or some simple vulnerabilities in a web application and, uh, or just like missing things. 
um, and how easy it could be to, to kind of compromise a user. So first thing is uh, is uh, if a site there's like these HTTP errors. Um, can, can you use the font size? look at the headers that our own site returns, there's one of them that's called the uh, X frame options here. Um, and uh, if I at the same time go on, let's see here, what well, you should mention the Wells Fargo. Um, so this is the uh, login page to my Wells Fargo account. Um, and uh, this is a kind of a, things, a very simple thing that a lot of people forget. Um, but what I notice here is that this header called X-Frame Options, either it could be same original deny, uh, is missing here. This means that this page in the app is essentially vulnerable to something called clickjacking, where you can load the, the page in an iframe on a different domain than it was possible. So if I want to um, you know, record or still credentials from any uh, bank user, uh, one approach would be to um, so I take this URL. That's this copy code. This tool from this video. This. If I then run this, so yeah. So what I did here is. Um, well, I'm just like loading an iframe, and the source is the login page for Wells Fargo. And you see, it works fine. Uh, if I did the same with our site or any other site, it would just be a blank page. But what uh, an attacker would do is say, okay, so this is possible. So maybe the domain called, well, let's say, Well Fargo, maybe that's not taken. So you're just going to buy that domain. It's going to make sure a few users into going to that domain. And then it's going to load the actual Wells Fargo page within an iframe there. And the user won't notice that load on the number one page. When I enter his credentials, the attacker can, you know, have a hidden frame. So they can record the credentials, forward them onto Wells Fargo, lock the user in, and then quietly just, you know, run away with the login credentials. And the user wouldn't know what happened until, you know, they're missing money from their account. Um, so it's a very simple thing, um, but uh, and it's a very simple fix. But uh, some pages just don't have it. Um, let's see, leave this page. Uh, another thing is you've probably also heard about, or if you read a little about web application security, something called cross-site scripting. Um, essentially, it's a, that's an attacker or a hacker though any JavaScript, any malicious JavaScript that they want to load. And if he can load any JavaScript, he can do whatever the user can do, uh, and a little bit more. Um, and an example of this, so we have our, uh, let's see here, yes, so I'm just going to look in here. Our vulnerable app. Yeah, so I'm just running here locally. And um, the tester, so this is a, I'm a security tester, this is I'm logging into my profile, and he figures out that he can actually, in his, uh, what he writes is a little description about himself. He can, um, well, he can write whatever he wants, add that, and if you can then go on and have a look, a look at his profile. Bam. So whatever the tester or the page, what it was put in the page has actually been interpreted as, as, as code and not just like rendered as it was. Um, so the, the developer here is just like rendering out like the raw material um, and not actually escaping outputs. Um, so in this case, I'm just like showing up the web page, but normally attack would just happen in the background. You wouldn't even notice that your uh, authenticated cookies or something got stolen and shipped out to a URL. Um, or, you know, 
uh, it makes a transaction on your behalf or copies of private keys. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. uh, so this is just like for, for you know whatever guy you get to, to render this this page, but if the same stuff get renders in the admin uh, section of your web application, then it's actually the, the admin token or whatever the admin uh, session that can get stolen and then do whatever the admin can do. So it can easily become very critical. So it's a common attack, for example, if you're able to inject JavaScript, then you'll find out who are the admin users, you'll inject that JavaScript in, in some page, then you'll write just the admin and say, hey, I have a problem with my profile, can you please log in and you know see if you can fix it, right? You know they're logging in, the same time you have the JavaScript running behind, sending his cookie, and you're logged in, right? And then you can do whatever he can do, uh, as long as yeah, he's not logging out, until you need to the cookie, and that kind of stuff. Um, so some of these attacks requires a little bit of social engineering, but often it's not very much. They're like the same I showed in the beginning with this iPhone, you kind of have to have the big and blow this URL somehow, but you know that can be done at least for send off emails. Um, so to put it into context, for example, uh, local bitcoins, they have uh, an issue at some point uh, where someone was loading up, uh, I think it was a passport information, and within that passport he had some JavaScript uh, similar kind of cross-site scripting attack. And then when he was, he was emailing users, a local Bitcoin say, hey, see, I'm a real user, and here, just check my passport, and you can verify exactly who I am, right? And when they kind of look at his passport, that JavaScript start running. Um, so that is definitely something that you, that you want to look at. <clears throat> okay, next example here. Um, of course, just stop if there are any questions. Uh, any web app probably have a password reset function. So let's see here. This guy's running. So <coughs> I forgot my password. So let's, let's I forgot my password. This. I'm oh, sorry, it wasn't with this. Um, so let's see. Christian at Purity. Send me instructions. Okay. Let's see if I get something here. Okay. Just gonna copy out this link that it gets in. Um, so this is uh, how it typically happens that uh, the website sends you some kind of token that you know works for a few hours or you know, requires some point, and with that, uh, it's going to be hooked up to a user, and the user can reset his his, uh, his password. Um, but in some cases, uh, developers would just instead of this. I think, what is this, 20 character or something, string. Um, we have seen cases where the token is just six digits, um, no characters, and in this case, you just have one million possibilities. And um, so if I want to hack Jacob's account, I would say, okay, I want to hack Jacob's account. I'm going to put in Jacob at uh, purity, purity, purity. So now I know that he has some kind of token sent to him. Um, then I just have to, you know, go to the URL and then test any number from one to yeah, one million, maybe only from one hundred thousand to one million if it's like required to be six digits. Um, and you know that could be done maybe in a few hours depending on how fast the website like can respond. Um, so just a simple thing. Um, again, and another thing. Uh, you know this here. I'm just going to go down here. And let's see if I can get this one to do something. I just want to get the, this. this. Yeah. So you see. Often people have like JavaScript running on their applications, and uh, we have a list, little Ola contact form down here, and it's sending requests back to you know the mothership once in a while, and maybe you have some Google Analytics or whatever you're running that sends data. And if I so it sent us some kind of request here recently, and if I scroll down here, <coughs> refer. Oops. 
Yeah, that's this referral URL. So when the OLAC receipt was requested, I also get the referral URL. Um, if we had just used a standard, we're uh, using Rails app here, um, standard Rails implementation or um, authentication implementation, the referral URL included this reset token sent to OLAC. Um, and it's like very, very soft thing. And uh, you know, it probably will expire in five or six hours or whatever. But uh, if there's some rogue employee at OLAC or you know, any other service, or essentially you have this uh, temporary password sitting there that you're suddenly sending out to other services. Um, so again, kind of soft little thing that you know you think you're very secure, but then you're leaving information here and there. <coughs> so as I just mentioned right now, we have kind of we have a very standard setup. Uh, we're Rails app running on the roof. Um, if you run just a standard Rails application uh, and uh, authentication, um, you are vulnerable to something called cookie replay, or um, you're not really actually being locked out when you're hitting lock out. So I'm going to show here. I'm going to log in again. Okay, so now I'm signed in. I'm going to go up here. This is kind of standard uh, Rails session uh, token. I'm going to copy that. And then I'm going to log out. You see, I refresh the front page. No, I'm not logged in. Go ahead, right in. I just copied the stuff we saw before. Uh, and now I'm pasting in, overwriting this uh, URL. So, uh, check. And try and go through it again. Bam, I'm back in again. So the only thing I did was just copy uh, like some letters. Uh, essentially, it's my cookie that is lying in my browser, and Rails is saying, hey, delete that cookie or write it with the one I'm sending you. But if for some reason that cookie sleeps somewhere or uh, a hacker gets access to that, no matter what the user do trying to log out, they will still be essentially locked in somewhere if, if there's a cookie lying somewhere. And you might have a timeout function or something, but if it gets hold of this cookie, you can keep renewing it or refreshing, you essentially are logged in for life. Or you have, until you know you reset the app secret or something really. That's kind of a big deal. Um, but it's not something most Rails developers know about. Um, and, yeah, just a subtle little thing, but uh, it can be very dangerous. Um, so normally these attacks will go hand in hand on it. So if you have a cross-site scripting, for example, error somewhere, then you have the cookie, right? And if the cookie doesn't expire, and you can do this attack basically for everyone. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing here, um, it's kind of again a subtle thing, but uh, it will uh, it kind of ties into the thing with the password reset I mentioned before. So I'm an attacker now, and I want to figure out who exists on this platform. So as you can see here, I'm going to enter in an email address. I'm pretty sure that exists. Okay, so now it tells me, so I wanted to have reset, you know, password reset to my email. It tells me I couldn't find the email. Okay, so this just doesn't exist. But if I then try this email I kept working on. Okay. So it tells me now that some instructions will be sent. Essentially, I get two different feedbacks depending on if the user exists. So that's, this is like the first step in in hacking this guy. First I figure out what users exist in the platform, or like get the correct email, then I can start caring about how do I get the password somehow. Um, so the, it can be very difficult to actually hide which emails exist on a platform, but um, all of these little leaks just make it easier for some of the other attacks that might have seemed possible in the first place. Um, and this is just one more piece. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we call it pair out here because the authentication we use, there's like a mode in, in Rails uh, where, you can, where you can set up that only show you know, the same feedback, whatever happens. Okay, so this was just like a few sample uh, examples of like attacks, and uh, there are of course many more, um, but just to give you an idea about all these little things that can happen. Um, then I'm just going to go through like what, what we have done for security and how we 
try to keep our platform as secure as possible. Um, uh, this is all your apps application security. Um, basically, we're using, I think we only have open source software on platform. Um, so, for uh, what we do for uh, authentication, you know, creating users, testing if users exist, is this very well known uh, gem called device. So, yeah, we're running it within Rails, so it's just. It's, you know, um, and the fact that device, which is our authentication gem, is uh, maintained, uh, it is open source, and so many eyes have always looked at this, we feel pretty confident that well, it doesn't have any backdoors and uh, that it doesn't have too many bugs in there. Um, so, and that goes with, with all the stuff that we do, that it's open source software that works like trusted repositories or trusted code. Um, yeah, of course, whenever a developer uh, creates a feature or fixes a bug, there's always another guy that you know, looks, looks through the code and just do a code review with, you know, maybe get some, some errors in there, so it's just regular stuff. Um, yeah, and as I said, we're running Ruby on Rails app, um, and one of the tools that, uh, one of the gems is something called Breakman. You, if you're using <coughs> Rails, you might have heard of it, but um, I'll just show you here. And, Looks from the terminal. So it's a little bit. So what Breakman is is a static uh, code analyzer, analyzer, and it is basically just going through all our code and uh, see if there is something that we missed. Um, so it looks at the, the source code. Uh, I did this earlier, so I have that big analyzer. <coughs> you can also output to an HTML file. So this is the same, just uh, in the browser. And it tells me that uh, it found two vulnerabilities in our code with weak confidence. Uh, there are some file access here. Uh, there's the file name, and also there might be some cross-site scripting. And if I want, I can like click on the link and get an explanation about, you know, what is this stuff and uh, how, can it, you know, what might have been wrong. Um, so if you're running a Rails app, definitely recommend doing something like Breakman. It goes, you know, checks that you. You know, do some checks. It can be short, of course, but that you're not like giving access to any files, or you're not you have typical cross-site scripting mistakes. Um, yeah. Does if that, there's like common issues found in gems that you might use, it will, or like uh, say open source code that we took from someone else to develop that we implement in our product, uh, but might, there might have been already security issues found found in those that we're not aware of. I mean, break them or automatically update their database, and then when we run our automatic scanner, we look at all our codes, all our gems, and what version we're using, and kind of giving us a alert for that, right? Because we're all humans, and we don't have knowledge around whatever you know, security issues that have been found out there. So having kind of these automatic tools that we can set up and configure and run on a daily and weekly basis, and you know, helps us just stay up to date on, on our code base. Uh, just like um, one example, I just noticed here is. Link to a checks. So that's, this is just a function of Rails that you put in a, you know, a piece of a string and say make it a link in, in the browser. And it's very tempting if, uh, so we saw the, the tester profile I showed before, the tester can fill in his, his details, he can maybe also put a link to his GitHub or to his personal website. Um, sure, we want to make that a link, but the fact that Ruby code is actually run on that piece of, on that string that he's putting in makes it vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. Because then you can embed some JavaScript in the, in the URL. Your, your yeah. um, so what I mentioned before is a white box testing, looking at the source code. Um, what we are also running is uh, on a periodic basis we're running a, a tool called Tinfoil, or from a company called Tinfoil Security, I think it's called. Um, and what it does is uh, it basically just scans our web application, looks for the URLs we provided, and clicks it on the link and see if we make. You know, put in some settings in like the password field, something that you know, our complete password field or typical, you know, hidden files that we got to remove or something like that. Just, you know, just picking up stuff that you might have forget, uh, forgotten to remove away. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about OWASP, but if you haven't, um, it's a really good resource. Essentially, it's uh, a Wikipedia for for web application security. Um, and uh, it's you have to just got to know this page. It provides you like top ten list of typical vulnerabilities in a Rails app, or on a WordPress app, or whatever you're running on. 
Uh, so you can like, go through that checklist. If you don't know what a cross-site scripting attack is, go in there and see what the, what it is and what the ramifications are. Um, and also they have made this tool called SUP, uh, again, uh, black box testing. Uh, you download to your, to your laptop and you provide a URL, and they will start like the, the simple as I mentioned before, uh, scan for the like, typical vulnerabilities. <coughs> What else? Yeah, so we are running on Heroku, but every request made to Heroku runs through the service called Cloudflare. So they call themselves a web application firewall. <coughs> so they yeah, filter a lot of stuff and make it easy to block into the IPs of countries and good protection about the DDoSing. And also really good for setting up like uh, SSL certificates or they can handle it for you that it's done properly. Um, that can easily go, you can easily make the wrong SSL settings there. Uh, we also do, so they can also do throttling, so just like limit the amount of requests coming to your app. Um, and, but we also do that in the app. Um, we use a VM called Rack Attack that Kickstarter thing made uh, open source uh, just to limit requests to specific paths. Um, essentially, again, monitoring. Uh, we have our logs that we make it, you know. Do all our logs, we uh, back up our logs. Should we get hacked, it's essential to have logs to go back and and uh, you know replay the history and figure out how did an uh, attacker get in there. So back up the logs, but store them safely. Uh, yeah, new relic, and we also use a tool called Opti, made for Django and Ruby on Rails apps. Uh, that is really good for you know error reporting and you know we have an app that can quickly check if there's something going on. So I really recommend Opti. Um, Oh yeah, uh, so every request coming to our site is uh, done our uh, SSL. Uh, we, we don't accept anything else. Um, there's this header called uh, HTTP Strict Transport Security, it's called, um, that we are providing, but, uh, and which means that whenever a user visits our site, the, the, the browser will remember only access to security uh, or SSL. Uh, but uh, there is this first initial request uh, where a user might go to our site, like they might just you know do like this and hit enter, um, and it will you can see it here. But essentially, it will just start doing a kind of an unencrypted request, and then of course at one point it will get redirected. But there's this little chance that you know attack with this this point intercept the request um, before the encryption is sent. So. Uh, so what Chrome and Firefox they actually have see this. Um, they have this H STS preloaded list so they you can submit your domain to Chromium developers and ask them to kind of bake your domain into the browser itself. So the browser will know that the domains in this list should only ever be accessed over SSL. So there won't even be a point where the browser would try it. And, and that Firefox would then copy that list and you know they have the same advantages of implementation there. Um, so it's not really a, 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 a you know, crazy issue, but um, you know, whatever you can add on top of security all the time. And it kind of feels nice to be, <laughs> be like in the browser, burned in. Um, and last but not least, we of course run up a bounce program on the cell all the time because we you know, we can also make mistakes and we also have you know we have a little bit of on the side as well that our tests are picked up and you know might want to not have been found before a hacker would you know find it. So a bounce program is just essential to catch the stuff that you that switch to the device. Yeah, back to Jacob. Cool. Uh, yeah, so just to add into that, I think um, what we're trying to say is just what are some of the things that you can do with your think of when building kind of web apps and traffic security. A lot of these tools, uh, we know, is kind of real specific, but I'm sure that similar tools exist for whatever framework that you use, right? Or for example, I mean, tools like um, uh, Tinfall Security that will just check for, for example, cross-site scripting attacks, and all these outside in and going on, on just your website are available to, to be used today. Um, yeah, and then it's just very exciting digging down into, into security. But one thing is, of course, how secure our, our web app 
uh, is it, it really doesn't matter if our personal security just sucks, right? Uh, so if you're able to just uh, steal my laptop now and then still just log in and you have access to, to everything. So it, we just also want to mention that, of course, having good internal practices around, uh, for example, always use screen lock for your, both for your laptop or your, for your smartphones or whatever, it's just, it should just be a requirement, basically, that uh, once new employees are starting, that they are asked to uh, set up screen lock on all devices, encrypt all hard drives, uh, they are not allowed access to Gmail or anything before they have two-factor authentication. And um, it should just be like this checklist, and it's a bit, it takes a bit of time in the beginning to kind of have these procedures up, and it's easier to, to kind of go the other way around, but just um, kind of build them in and uh, kind of make a culture around enforcing these type of procedures. Because simple stuff like having two-factor authentication on your Gmail, on your hosting provider, on you know all these other tools that you that you get that you have are um, could be the weakest link in where attackers would go. Um, so it's just and, and it improves the security so much. So like don't uh, like leave your laptop and run to the bathroom because that might be the chance that someone in the room you know, just like forward all these emails to my email. Then you reset password, you know. Um, so routing up it's not just uh, security not just like throw money at it or you know buy a tool and then you're safe because if you, if you just misbehave, you know, then no tool can kind of do that. You just have to also think ultimately. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes you can do stuff which is very easy and very, which is very easy and adds a lot of security. And to give you an example, uh, for example, our admin panel at the at the aircraft could of course give us access to, um, for example, resetting uh, user accounts and just do normal admin work for for, for users on the platform. But also, uh, it is exposed on, on the internet, right? So it is exposed exposed via browser. But nobody should ever have access to that besides kind of you know well, three or four people within our team. Um, so you can, uh, for example, what, what one of the things that we have done is just restricting that area of our application to IP addresses. So we have listed like eight IP addresses and only those who have access to that part of our application. And it's so simple; it takes like literally ten minutes to code and, and do, and then you just solve all of that, right? Or not that it's a kind of complete solution. But it really helps a lot, right? It means that you need to, to be there. Then, of course, it's frustrating sometimes when I'm on the Starbucks and I cannot log into to admin, and that's just it, right? That's the kind of the, the trade-off you have to do uh, in order to get these this, this extra security. Um, yeah, so that's kind of tying. You can see some of the features we have in, in the physical world into the online world. That is just, I mean, no attacker would be able to to prove for how admin login. I even find it and know where it is. Um, so, but then might be other other weak links um, that we hope to identify and solve. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was a lot around how, how we do uh, security, uh, everything from kind of the app level to our personal security. Um, and uh, as we talked a bit on the, in the beginning, we do kind of deliver a bounty program as a service to a lot of these Bitcoin exchanges, Bitcoin businesses. And we run, of course, a bug bounty program on our own site, uh, which Richard mentioned that we have paid out a couple of rewards. But we also uh, kind of want to uh, take bug bounty program to the next level and exper experimenting with different ways to do that. And one of the one of the things, more like an experiment that we came up with, is called capture the coin. And, and I'll explain a bit around how it works, and then we will we will do a demo, and hopefully it will be a lot of fun. <laughs> But first of all, I mean, capture the coin is just an experiment. Um, so it's something that we are trying to, to basically learn from how we can use uh, the features of Bitcoin to improve our own security. So I'll explain to you what we're going to say here. Um, so what we have done is in some s sensitive areas of our, of our website, we have in our, in, this is our production site, we have hidden some, uh, basically, some Bitcoin private keys. Um, so one example, for example, we have hidden a Bitcoin private key, we call that the Nakamoto reward, uh, and on the public address corresponding to that uh, key, we have deposited at the moment 1.5 uh, Bitcoin. Um, so for that, 
that private key to kind of unleash uh, those, that, those Bitcoin are at the moment stored, stored within our kind of admin panel. Uh, meaning that if some, uh, and we've been kind of public around it, right? That's saying this is this is the case, and uh, basically asked uh, security researchers to see if they can break in and just you know um, find their private key, steal it, and redeem the money. Uh, so why have we done that? So one of the things that is uh, typical for, for for bounty programs is that in you have a, a business owner running a, an application or a, a business running an application and then you have security researchers. So the way it works with these security researchers, they will try to identify the issue, report it, and then they will have to wait for the accept or the acknowledgement of the business to basically pay out the bounty. But what we have defined here up front is basically saying, well, if someone is able to break into our you know, admin panel or some of these sensitive areas straight away, I mean, you don't need accept for us. I mean, just take that, take that, you know, small amount or whatever. Take those bitcoins straight away, and um, I mean, there's no, no, yeah, we don't need your accept, right? So it's kind of one way to experiment, uh, kind of with that feature. The other thing which provides us is that since we're kind of open and transparent around it, now we've written a blog post and everybody can just monitor these public addresses. So if we are compromised, or if someone is breaking in and taking taking those private keys, it's, it's very difficult for us to, to lie about it and say, you know, well, it didn't happen, or we'll have to, you know, somehow explain uh, what happened and, and you know, do it in, a, in an honest manner. Uh, and the third thing, which is, uh, of course, extremely cool, is that we can uh, monitor uh, the blockchain. Uh, so we can monitor how the movements are on, on these addresses, and of course, you know, build in automatic uh, actions and, and you know, proactive um, and once we see any different kind of movements, and then tie those movements into our into our application by you know, <coughs> shutting it down, for example. And yeah, and this is actually what we've done. Um, so this there is in, in security, you, you talk around this called intrusion detection system. That of course, if, if an intruder breaks into your web app, you want to detect that and, and take some actions based on that. And you can think around this as a, as a way to build an intrusion detection system, but with bitcoins, and then have, have monetary values on these addresses. So what I wanted to do now is uh, I'm going to show you in our staging environment. We've made a, we have made a vulnerable private key um, and um, basically exposed that. And what should happen if someone steals it? Uh, is that we should just close down our, our app, basically. Um, so, go to the whole thing. Yes. And the tester. Yeah. Um, so what you see here, what we have done in, in our production environment is that we have basically listed the public key in, in, the, in the tester section of one of, our, um, one of our security tests on the platform, a fake test that we made just for, for the purpose, right? And the private key, we have in this case, you're exposed in the vulnerable app. In, in the production, of course, it is hidden somewhere in the address section where it should not be accessible to anybody, right? Um, so what I want to do now is basically open a bit address here. So there should... Yes, so this is, uh, I just want to show, this is the, the, the public address of our blockchain, and there's a lot of Bitcoins on, on here, right? It's around uh, $1 in Bitcoin. Uh, do we have any group around it? So essentially, uh, in a, I think we're, we're going to show you the, the private key that the hacker would find, say within our admin panel in this case, and the profile that should be private. And if they are able to to get to to that private key, thing, and uh, we would want to react to that. Yeah. Yes. So I don't know if you are ready, or if there is someone who will be able to. Um, basically, uh, take that private key and oh, then... Sorry. <laughs> Volunteer. 
well, it would. <laughs> it would be good if you can kind of, uh, you need to move the Bitcoin out of your, uh, into another address. Oh, sorry, you just go, if you're faster, then go for it. <laughs> oh, no. I should get a notification. <laughs> So with it, it's, uh, it's kind of glued together, different services, so hopefully it works. Um, but uh, if someone gets a chance to use yeah. Bitcoin, then it is. I got it. Is it away? Yes, I got a text at least. <laughs> you got a text? Uh, okay, so what just happened, uh, yes, exactly. So basically we are monitoring uh, the blockchain and someone kind of swept the address and, and, and took it in, moved those Bitcoin into their own address. So we just set up, uh, we are monitoring that, putting in a uh, request back to our app, basically um, shutting it down and putting it in the maintenance so, mode. So if we um, go to our application here and I would reload, um, <laughs> so it's just shut down, right? Um, so this is pretty cool uh, because <laughs> Whoa. Uh, nobody would be, you would basically stop there as an attacker, right? Uh, and um, imagine, so right now we just put, you know, one dollar but imagine that it was $10,000, or $100,000, or $1 million. You could put in these keys different places on your app, and if I want to tag, I would each time look up that, but okay, how much is on there? Now I'm gonna dig a bit deeper, right? Uh, but at some point, I mean, one million, okay, I'll take it, and I'll close down the app, right? Um, or you have to be very strategic, on, okay, I'll go around, and I'll pick all these private keys, and then I'll redeem all them. But it becomes kind of a, a strategic game, uh, and that is, uh, or someone else doing, right? It becomes a competition. But we just know for sure that if someone, you know, grabs those Bitcoin, you know, we'll move we'll those our app, we'll monitor it, and go back on the logs to see what the hell happened, what, what happened, right? And so, and you can do it in even. Uh, so now it's it's done very simple. We just monitor uh, movements. But I mean, by stop there, you could also just you know look at different. So how much is being moved down, right? It could also be that if you see transactions above, I don't know, a certain amount of Bitcoin, that you just close your app, right? Uh, but or it's just like some simple stuff that you, um, yeah, leaking kind of less important information and it's more important that your app keeps on, you know, restrict certain areas of the app or kind of go in uh, between mode. So you can easily do uh, this. We just made this kind of example, just like shut down the app until we figure out the So you can think of that I'm kind of, I mean, what I what we're thinking around is combining really the analytics of the of the transactions that we see on the blockchain with the security of our app. Right? If you got all that, all that in your browser. Anyway, thank you for uh, <laughs> participating and you, and you got got some money there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Are there any uh, are there any questions, Nathan? Yeah. Uh, yes. What's the potential importance of uh, this perspective on web app security to startup businesses? What's the potential? What's the potential importance of this to startup businesses? Like. Well, I think wait, if you just started yesterday, and if you're if you're not doing a Bitcoin business, you know you just, you have to have something to protect. I mean, if you're your security person, you never you know get off the ground as a startup. What is that to protect? But as soon as you start to having you know, of course, with the Bitcoin, but it could also just be whatever information you have about users. Um, you just start caring more and more. The more data or money that you keep, of course, you have to think of, think more about it. Um, yeah, um, the users are essentially whatever it's uh, it's uh, Bitcoin or information they're trusting with the data. So. But I think one of the things that we see is that uh, being a startup now, just three guys and doing something with Bitcoin. I mean, if you're just having a bit of value, you need to think about uh, security very early on in, in the in the startup's lifetime, and that is something completely new because security used to be something for banks, right? And you have big corporate institutions with a lot of a lot of money, and therefore you also need new, new security solutions where you can just like three clicks get up and running. It has to be cheaper, it has to be smarter, it has to be more agile, and then. Um, that is kind of all that what kind of the Bitcoin really is pushing in the kind of the security space and that we are forced to believe that we can help solve. Right? Okay. We've got the kill frag from, uh, from Tariq. So if there are any more questions, then just come and join us afterwards and then uh, so we can people all can right. hear some <laughs>